Hello and welcome. I'm Adi Keo, Editor-in-Chief of the AMA Journal of Ethics. Thank you for joining us for this video edition of Ethics Talk. I'm here with Dr. Jenna Lester, an Assistant Professor of Dermatology at the University of California at San Francisco. We will be talking about disparities in dermatological health care exposed during this COVID-19 pandemic and its contributions to longstanding health inequities. Dr. Lester, thank you for being a guest on Ethics Talk today. Thank you for having me and thanks for highlighting this issue. So dermatological conditions and diseases among people of color are routinely overlooked and misdiagnosed. So what are some of the dermatological manifestations of COVID? And more importantly, how has the inability to properly interpret dermatological conditions and diseases in patients of color exacerbated health inequities during this pandemic and beyond? So I think possibly the most famous um, or well-known dermatologic manifestation of COVID is the so-called COVID toes um, or acral perniosis. Um, and this is just a purplish red discoloration of the tops and tips of the toes that have been um, um, recognized in many patients with COVID-19. Um, but there have been a wide number, a, a wide array of cutaneous manifestations described: papulosquamous eruptions, pityriasis, rosea-like eruptions, mm. um, more vasculitic type lesions as well. Um, and a lot of these have a basis of inflammation, and inflammation appears differently in different. Uh, tones of skin. So what may look red or pink in someone with light skin may actually look purple to blue and um, or d darker, just dark brown even in someone with darker skin. So you can see how, you can understand how if your eye is not trained to recognize these things um, in different skin tones, it might be quite easy to miss it. And even outside of the context of COVID-19, when we see some of these same sorts of rashes or patterns of inflammation, it's, it's de definitely different um, recognizing it in patients with darker skin. Yeah. And to address the second part of your question about um, how has this created disparities in COVID-19? Well, one can only guess because I don't really know that we can understand the magnitude of any co contributor to disparities in this condition yet. I, am, I imagine that that will be more of a retrospective analysis yeah. when we hopefully get to the other side of this pandemic. But um, when we think about um, the fact that there's uh, disparities in access to testing and the ways that the testing is distributed, who has access to those across the country, um, what the, the difference in symptomatology that people experience, um, anything from very mild symptoms to very to much more serious symptoms that may prompt them to go to the doctor. Yeah. One of the great things about the skin is that it's an external organ that the patients can look at with us. So if patients, if doctors and then subsequently patients are aware of the manifestations in all different skin tones, so they can doctors can counsel their patients of all different types of what this might look like. We might be able to say, hey, if you notice something like this on your skin, this could be a sign, an early sign of COVID-19. You should yeah. consider sheltering in place, self-isolating, getting testing if you can. So you can imagine if this, if any one of these cutaneous manifestations does end up being an early sign once we have more research and examples to support that, um, if someone is not able to recognize this, they may spread it more broadly in their community if they're not able to respond appropriately. Yeah, I appreciate what you just said and the point that beyond COVID, uh, how cutaneous uh, conditions manifest across many diseases is something that we need to keep uh, attention on. So given that, what do you think needs to be done to hold clinicians and educators more accountable for addressing uh, racial and ethnic disparities in dermatological care that exacerbate health inequities? 
Yeah. Um, I, I like to think of this rather than an individual physician failure. I like to think of it as a systemic issue. This, there are many examples in medicine that we've been discussing more recently of structural racism or structural inequities. And I think the root of many of those exist in medical education. And that's um, one area that I'm focused on. We, um, early, you know, early on in my interest in this particular area, we looked at our common dermatology teaching textbooks and found that um, a, a minority of these photos are actually in patients of skin with um, darker skin. So when you look at psoriasis, you see many photos of psoriasis in patients with lighter skin, but you don't see it in darker skin. And furthermore, there's an overrepresentation of dark skin in, um, in the chapters on sexually transmitted infections. Mm -hmm. So you can see how powerful biases are created in the minds of our learners when you're looking through textbooks and sometimes your only exposure to a disease is your photo, uh, the photos that you're looking at in these textbooks. So I think we need to think about increasing representation in our, of our photographs in dermatology specifically, but also, not just photographs, thinking about how we teach um, uh, dermatology so that we're teaching people to recognize things in all different skin tones. So we're not saying this is a, the salmon pink patches of psoriasis, which is how they're described, are classic presentations of psoriasis because psoriasis in someone with dark skin does not look like that. And are we are we then othering people with dark skin and saying they don't have classic representation or presentations of types of disease? Right. So I think it goes beyond the photos. It goes to the language we use when we are um, teaching learners how to diagnose dermatologic disease. Um, and so I think when you um, when you push people to do these things, it, 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 it represents or it manifests itself in other areas. So they then think more about how are they balancing research studies when they go on to become attendings who are conducting original research? Are they representing all patients of all different races and ethnicities in their research studies? I think if you, so this idea that um, representation is important early on in their medical education, then that is something that's not unusual to them as they go on throughout their um, medical career. So I think it starts with education. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think uh, the systemic issues are ones that we definitely need to focus on and tackle. But I also know that you direct uh, at UCSF uh, a skin of color clinic. Can you speak a little bit about that from a clinician standpoint as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the skin of color program has a clinical aspect. We're developing a research aspect and also an educational aspect um, as well. And so clinical care is the most important um, thing or you know, very important in all of these, this sort of three-arm approach to this program. And um, what I am trying to do is create um, a dermatologic home. There's research that suggests that patients of color, particularly black patients, appreciate having um, a dermatology space that is built for them. They, they feel better getting care in a skin of color clinic than in a general dermatology clinic. Uh, my ultimate goal would be that these clinics don't have to exist, that we're able to provide this same type of care where patients feel as comfortable in any dermatology setting. Right. But for now, I think um, it's important to create a place where these patients feel comfortable um, coming and returning to. Uh, and, and once we create a place where they feel more comfortable presenting, perhaps we'll see an alleviation of these issues where patients of color are less likely to seek dermatologic care or, um, and they feel satisfied with their care. Yeah. And as a result of them being in our clinics and in our um, academic learning spaces, residents and medical students have exposure to these patients and see the nuances that we have to um, engage in when we're caring for the, this um, group of patients. Yeah. Uh, so, so the idea is to center clinical care and then um, education and research sort of come after that as um, an added uh, addition to this program. Yeah, as you just uh, referenced a, mo a moment ago about accessing dermatological care. So people of color are half as likely to seek outpatient dermatological care than white non-Hispanic people. This access to care problem um, 
is due to several factors. You've already mentioned the comfort of um, level that people may have in the settings that they uh, are in vis-a-vis -vis dermatological care, but also includes shortages of dermatologists and dermatologists being among specialties least likely to accept Medicaid. Mm -hmm. How can we address this access to care problem given that dermatology is oftentimes seen as a financially lucrative specialty and it's highly competitive among medical students seeking a residency slot. Yeah, and I think that is a really um, important question. And there are probably um, many different factors that go into this. And I don't pretend to be an expert on all of them, but I think one thing that you mentioned is this issue of Medi Medicaid patients and their access and disparities of care, which to my knowledge, exists across our medical system. And um, I mean, there are studies real, really in every disease process of how patients with Medicaid have poorer health outcomes. And, and you know, thinking about why that could be, that could be an issue of payment. You know, doctors don't see these patients as um, um, having um, fair remuneration. And so um, how can we, how can we, or how can, you know, the Medicaid system think about creating a more fair reimbursement system for these patients so they're on par with Medicare and private payers. I think that is a really important question and I'm not a healthcare ec economist, so I can't answer that, but I think that that's probably central um, to, to the conversation. Um, and then your point about medical students being, th this be being seen as a lucrative specialty and medical students really wanting to come to dermatology, maybe for that reason, maybe for others. How can we address um, the level of debt that medical students are graduating with so they don't feel so pushed to um, go into a specialty that they see as financially lucrative, maybe for reasons other than caring for all different types of patients and really to make more money because the truth is that our medical students are graduating with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and with no, um, with, with no foreseeable way to pay it off without making a ton of money. So I think that, um, that there are, again, structural issues that feed into this problem. And we identify the issue and then think beyond it and think three steps upstream as to why that might be the case. I think those are two examples um, that I can think of. But, you know, as an academic dermatologist, I see all different types of patients. I see it as my responsibility and also my pleasure to do that because I went into medicine to address issues of access to care, to care for all patients, to not, um, to not sort of eliminate someone based on their insurance type. And I'm a part of a big institution, so we're able, we're able to do that. And I like to assume good intentions and um, think that if we align things in the right way, most physicians probably would take that stance. But because of the way that our healthcare system is set up, people feel pressured and are oftentimes unable to do that. So I think that there are structural issues here that we really need to address in order to fix this problem and ultimately improve patient care and access. Yeah, no, I appreciate your the points that you've made throughout our uh, conversation about the systemic level, the structural level issues, the upstream level issues that need to be addressed in providing uh, quality care to all patients, whether it's in dermatology, whether you're a dermatologist or a non-dermatologist. Right. So I think your points are well taken. So finally, I'd like to end our conversation with the skin, but not necessarily dermatological example of health mm -hmm. inequity mm -hmm. amplified by this pandemic. So the pulse oximeter is a device that measures blood oxygen saturation by shining two lights, one infrared and one red, through the finger and sensing how much comes through on the other side. Mm -hmm. However, studies dating back 15 years have found that dark skin decreases the accuracy of pulse oximetry. Given this and other examples of medical devices and algorithms that uh, encode racial bias, what should dermatologists and the medical profession as a whole be doing to address these problems in advancing health equity? 
Yeah, I, th- I think that central to a lot of these issues is the lack of diversity within healthcare. If you think about a business, a, a, a business team, like in, you know, corporate America, um, they have shown that more diverse boards, um, advisory boards, executive boards mean better products and more, um, you know, more productivity, more financial productivity. I think we need to think of that sort of transposed in medicine. We are only as good as the teams that we build Mm -hmm. because diversity of teams means diversity of thoughts and ideas. And when I spoke to people about the work that I was doing, you know, say I only see dark skin when we're talking about sexually transmitted infections and I don't see dark skin represented in any other aspect. You know, when I spoke to some physicians about this, they're like, I never thought of this before. Let's figure out how to fix this. So sometimes people, uh, I think often people have good intentions, but they really can operate only off their own experiences. I think some people are very good at taking on the experiences of others and, um, and, you know, whether they're coming up with a project or interacting with a patient, using that empathy in a way to, um, to affect their ultimate product or the ultimate interaction. But some people really are best at using their own experiences um, when they're operating in life. And so I think that's, it's a, it creates blind spots for all of us. So if we have more teams that have more diversity of thoughts and ideas, things like this wouldn't happen. So we would have people that are, that, you know, scientists who are saying, well, based on the physics of this light, we know that passing through a darker pigment may impact the way that the reader is picking up on the um, pulse ox. And so um, we should think about that when we're creating this product. And I think that medicine has an issue with diversity. Dermatology has an issue with diversity. We know that there are fewer black men in medical school now than there were in the 70s. So um, how can we as a, as a profession um, uh, diversify the people who, are, who, are, who make up our profession so that we have a diversity of thoughts and ideas and approaches to problems and um, solutions as well? Uh, I really think that that is central to solving a lot of these issues. During this pandemic, we've seen, I don't know how active you are on Twitter, but but I, I think Twitter is interesting because it's it sort of creates an egalitarian access to a podium for a lot of people. And I have yeah. personally noticed a lot of um, black women, uh, people that identify as women, being leaders in this, in this um, in sort of discussion of racial disparities. And so what if we were have given these same people access to this same podium um, 10 years ago? How would our conversation be much different at this point? Yeah. So I think we've noticed the richness that these people bring to this conversation and that we need to um, enliven our discussion using people from diverse backgrounds or pro- by promoting the voices and amplifying the voices of people from diverse backgrounds. Yeah. Well, on that uh, aspirational note, I want to thank Dr. Lester for sharing her expertise and insights with our audience today. Dr. Lester, thanks again for being a guest on Ethics Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. For more COVID ethics resources, please visit the AMA Journal of Ethics at journalofethics.org. And to our viewing audience, be safe and be well. We'll see you next time on Ethics Talk.